good morning good evening good afternoon because we have participants from uh, all parts of the world and it's wonderful uh, being here uh, with you uh, today welcome to the session of the world university summit on the universities of the future and the theme of uh, our session which is uh, session 9 in this summit is particularly interesting it's about the paradigm shift based on the role that technology can play in strengthening the universities of the future and uh, my name is sunil sangra i'm a professor at the school of liberal arts and humanities at the up jindal global university and i'm delighted to welcome all of you all the viewers and particularly our very distinguished panelists starting with professor sophie uh, damour who is a rector at laval university in quebec in canada professor ravi pense he's the vice president of information technology at the uh, university of michigan ann arbor usa Professor Colin Potts, who is the Provost and Executive Chancellor at the Missouri, Missouri University of Science and Technology, also in the USA. Dr. Namrata Tognata, who is an Education Specialist for the South Asian region with the World Bank and based in the US. Uh, and Dr. Krishna Bista, who is the Vice President of the Star Scholars Network. I'll just quickly set the context and then we'll move into uh, discussions. So the COVID-19 pandemic has really proven that technology solutions will minimize disruption, maintain security, and support uninterrupted education during emergency crises that affect the business as usual functioning of institutions. By allowing students, teachers, and researchers to access secure digital education tools from anywhere on any device, a cloud-ready, easy-to-use digital environment provides opportunities for continuous learning and research. Cutting edge digital education tools allow communication, collaboration and testing over networks and provide both embedded security and flexibility with their features and qualities evolving continuously. It is now clear that in the post pandemic world, new age teaching, learning and research methods would be the hallmarks of higher education. And there is a need for universities to move beyond the traditional forms of teaching, learning and doing research and embrace these uh, rapid technological advancements. A rich student experience is also possible through, collab through collaborative learning using uh, virtual global classrooms. With dig digitalization, universities can bring internationalization home for students and teachers through the introduction of blended learning. Digital technologies also facilitate opportunities for collaboration between universities from different countries and regions. Research collaboration can itself build an international scientific and technological community for sharing data and information while undertaking collaborative research. Based on mutual respect, international standards for science and, science and scientific research. You know, additionally, the pandemic has also enabled universities to embrace technology and thereby creating a greater opportunity to utilize technology driven solutions to manage their administrative processes more efficiently. So this session will really discuss how these technologies will revolutionize national and global education and research opportunities, transform the governance of an institution to create greater levels of efficiency and transparency, provide avenues for encouraging global mobility programs and showcase how digital disruption could help prepare students for the careers of the future. With this uh, setting up of the context, may I now uh, start off with the uh, Rector uh, Damur, please. And the question that I would like to really raise for you, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Damur is, you know, most universities have trans transitioned to the online format of teaching and learning across roughly the last year and a half. What have been some of the key benefits and challenges of using technology to drive higher education uh, during this pandemic? What has been your experience? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sangra. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. This is a very important question. We're, we're in fact uh, working on this on campus, you know, reflecting on all of what we've learned this year. And, and I must say that um, we've seen a very interesting benefit. Uh, first of all, but you need to know, I mean, I would believe that this might be very different from university to university, but at our university, I would say we were um, quite advanced with our digitalization. So we had our own platform. We are 
most of, I mean, more than 96% of our class were uh, deployed through a digital platform. Students were taking classes uh, online very frequently. Uh, we were the second in Canada in terms of volume offering of online courses. So we had some capacity there. So when uh, our prime minister called for a closure of the universities in Quebec, we were able to argue that we could uh, shift very rapidly online. So my perspective might be different and would be different if this would not be part of our university at the time. The benefit we saw uh, was that we've uh, We've seen more students coming to our university when we were 100% online. And when we digged in and really looked at who are those new students coming uh, and wanting to be educated, um, we could really uh, observe that more people want to upskill they want to re-qualify. And I think the pandemic really brought uh, the need or, uh, you know, people talked about their future in a different way and saw the opportunity. So, you know, group of students with uh, older than 30 years old went up, uh, you know, increased drastically. Students who were coming back to school increased drastically. Uh, people working and studying, people with young kids. So we could really dig in and understand that there was a need and there's an opportunity for long life learning experience and proposal and that those students are looking for online education. So we saw that. that so we saw also uh, new possibilities. What, what, what became very obvious also and um, we didn't see that coming at first with the fact that um, if we wanted to scale up as we had to do, we needed to provide and offer training in technopedagogy to our people. And that was a key. That was a fantastic uh, moment at our university. We thought we're gonna propose a lot of classes to our professors, they're busy. You know, they have been so busy this year. We all know that. And um, as, as of today, 11,000 participation of lecturer and professor have occurred in classes on technopedagogy. So we really saw an appetite to be better at doing that. And it, it changes the way we integrate, we become more flexible and people are looking at the future. Challenge, and I'll be quick, cyber threat, they're there every single day, all the time, it's tough. Uh, the digital divide, divide, even though our student, you know, we had a picture of our student on campus 90% of them have a, 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 an intelligent device. 70 had three. They were online all the time. When they were outside of campus, the situation changed. The network is not there everywhere. And that was a challenge for us. And uh, the shift and the challenge, you know, is an opportunity, but it's not simple to do. University or our big organizations, so how to get agility in there so that we are more aligned with some very critical need of highly uh, skilled people in a time of post-COVID. So that's that's a challenge, but you know, it's uh, it's been a, a year where we saw a community, and it's it's true at our university, but I saw it across Canada. I'm chairing the board of Universities Canada. I saw fantastic contribution of university to society, but we saw people caring, being engaged, working with their communities in so many ways. And I think that also has been a, a benefit. And, and the fact that we could do it online made it possible to a larger scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rector. And you know, this aspect of lifelong learning, I think is a very relevant aspect which you raised in the beginning. 
And if we have the time, I'd love to revisit that with uh, some of the other colleagues on the panel a little later. If I may come to Professor Pienza, please. Uh, uh, Ravi, uh, you know, you, 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 you're a university that, a large university. I believe your population is in the region of about 100,000. And uh, you talked about how you have uh, had to overnight transition to the online mode. And sure, I mean, you must have done some, some things which have, would have worked well for you. I'm more interested in, you know, the, maybe the viewers would want to know what are the things that worked well in this entire process? And how do you see the future on account of this, right? My only request is, uh, since it's gonna be a, the time is a big constraint, uh, my request is four minutes, please. Yeah. And I appreciate the, I appreciate the warning. Since all of us yeah. are also faculty members, uh, uh, we are probably in mode of teaching for 50 or 75 minutes. So the, the, this kind of warning is always a good thing. Uh, so th th thank you so much, first of all, uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure and honor. And kudos to the organizing team of JGU. I have never received uh, as many reminders and emails and information and all of that was extremely helpful. So uh, a great lesson for us on how to organize things well from all of you. So great job, Sunil, by you and your team. So we greatly appreciate it. Uh, with uh, regards to your question, just to give you a quick flavor of uh, what University of Michigan looks like, uh, we have altogether about 63,000 plus students, uh, about 9,000 faculty members, 37,000 staff members. And this does not include population of our very large hospital as well. So we have a teaching hospital as part of the university. Uh, the annual budget of the university is about $10 billion. We have a $14 billion endowment. The annual research at Michigan is uh, upwards of $1.62 billion a year. That's the largest of any public university in the world, actually. And so on March 11th, uh, the executive team, which I'm part of, uh, made a decision that the campus would be closed on March 12th and March 13th, and effective March 16th, everything was going to switch online. And uh, which was uh, quite an interesting task, but the great news was uh, that the culture of care uh, is, exists among our faculty, staff, students, and everybody. So it's, it's part of our DNA, the culture of care, caring about each other and stepping up. So the entire campus responded to that uh, expectation and everyone stepped up to give you some of the things we did and we did it well. And this goes back to uh, some of the comments made by uh, uh, distinguished Dr. Am Amers here. Uh, people stepped up and we had to make sure that we had the appropriate bandwidth and she talked about network capacity and so on and access that was available to our faculty, staff and students. So this required us overnight to put processes in place where if our students didn't have the very best laptop and now they're expected to certainly work from home anywhere in the country, we made a program available where on demand, we shipped laptops to our students, faculty and staff anywhere in the country. Uh, brand new laptops were shipped to them so they could run, continue to run the software. We renegotiated contracts with all of our vendors to ensure that all the software was possible to be run from individual machines should that be needed. So we had to take that step as well. Uh, in terms of faculty members, uh, Professor Amor talked about training. Overnight, we had to stand up hundreds of hours of training for faculty, staff, and students, uh, depending on the, what your role was. We also had to make available the virtual private network capacity. You talked about security and cybersecurity. We needed to make sure that our important digital properties were secure as people were accessing from all over the country and in some cases, different parts of the world. Some of our students were stuck in certain foreign countries. And some countries do not allow free access to all of the websites. And I'm sure you know what countries I'm talking about there without naming them. So we set up special high-speed internet access from certain countries directly to our Ann Arbor network by working with different providers across the way. So students could access information from literally anywhere in the world at the rate at which they would be doing it uh, while they were in Ann Arbor. It did not always work well, but for most part, it uh, did work well. Uh, we also, uh, you know, frankly, uh, were also concerned about the aspects of uh, mental health and wellness, because when you're together, uh, you are reaching out to each other, you're saying hello, and, you know, virtual medium is great, but it's not the same as in person. So we need to make sure we also focused on mental health, the wellness of not just students, but also faculty and staff. So we made sure that those resources were available both online as well as any place else. This platform that we are using right now, the Zoom platform, 
we made it available. We deployed it across the university in over a day. In one day, the team stepped up and rolled the platform out with all of the appropriate tools and documentation and so on, in addition to other video platforms that we had, conferencing platforms, because we were concerned about uh, not putting all our eggs in one basket. So we wanted backup platforms available since now all of a sudden, all the classes, all of the research and everything was dependent. And I can go into a lot more details, but with respect to time, let me hold off here and happy to get into many, many more details of interesting things uh, that we learned along the way. So I'll pause there and uh, defer it back to you. Thank you, Ravi, that was wonderful. And in fact, uh, if we have the time, I'm gonna come back to you with a perspective on the future, that how does this uh, inform the future as we go forward? Yeah, but let me first now go to uh, Professor Potts. And we've had some very interesting uh, uh, emails that we exchanged. And Professor Potts came out with a very, very fascinating perspective, which I think uh, many of us may not have uh, really considered. So I, 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 we discussed that we we'll focus on that, that perspective uh, in his segment. And it's all about, you know, how can technology be leveraged to improve coherence in curricula? Uh, how can technology be used to manage uh, sequencing of courses? Professor Potts, you of course come from a science and technology university, but uh, along with science and technology, it'd be wonderful if you could also shed some light on how this might translate to a liberal arts and humanities university as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, um, I think it's, in, I mean, I, I'd like to echo what Ravi said about thanking the organizers here. I mean, isn't it wonderful that we're having an international conference, um, you know, at different times of the day in different parts of the world, and we can all participate, even if we could fly, very few of us would have done. And I think it's, uh, this, this in itself, we can take so many things for granted over the past year that we've uh, been forced into actually that have turned out to be blessings in disguise um so the uh, one of the things i think that we have to be really aware of with technology is and, and, and it's been a research area of mine for many years is, is that um we can often get uh, over enthusiastic about the benefits and lose sight of some of the challenges that technology presents and in particular some of the rather um uh, immutable cultural obstacles to adoption and, um, and, and a backdrop of how technology is used. Um, one of the, um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm glad you asked about liberal arts as well as science and technology. One of the things that I'm involved in personally is that I'm the, also the president of an organization which is just changing its name, so it's confusing. It's the, uh, um, uh, it's the Association for Undergraduate Education at Research Universities. Um, which used to be called the Reinvent Reinvention Collaborative. So you can look it up actually under that name, reinventioncollaborative.org. And uh, we're a coalition of about 80, uh, 83, 84, I think now, uh, research universities in the United States. And we're trying to counteract the narrative that, um, uh, the false narrative, but it used to be true that um, research universities have kind of lost the commitment to undergraduate education, which is arguably our primary mission. Um, and um, one of the things that we're, we're, we're working on um, collectively with the um, um, APLU and the um, uh, Powered by Publics Coalition, some other organizations, is um, some work on what we're calling curricular analytics, which was work that was pioneered by uh, Greg Heilman at the University of Arizona and Shawi Abdallah, who's at Georgia Tech, which was the institution I was at for 28 years until, until just a few months ago. And what, it, what the idea is to take the curriculum as a, as a map, as a, as a diagram, as a graph, and analyze its structure to see where there might be pressure points. You know, where are the, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the, uh, uh, which are the courses that have the most prerequisites and which have the greatest influence on future success? Um, and then to lay on top of that structural data, uh, what's the, um, uh, what are the success metrics for these courses and the ones that flow into it and flow out of it? And you can learn a lot about um, student success from that kind of analysis, as opposed to, it's complementary with the kind of more traditional approach to student analytics, where you're looking at individuals and you're saying, well, who's at, quote, at risk of, uh, of, of, of you know, not fulfilling their potential in certain courses and so forth. And I think that, so that's the technology and it's cool, you know, and as a, as a, a psychologist who became a computer scientist, that's me, you know, I, I'm, I'm motivated by cool technology, 
But the real question is culturally, um, how, does this, how does this help students? How could this help students understand the coherence of their curriculum? And why are they taking certain courses? And why do we have courses? You know, there's a great deal of pressure, I think, coming from um, uh, educational technology uh, startups, some of whom are very, I think, uh, invested in educational thinking and some of whom are kind of trying to make a fast buck and don't really understand teaching and learning. Um, there's a great deal of pressure to um, decouple and atomize and um, unbundle and just break apart the curriculum into smaller and smaller and smaller units uh, that students get competency quote badges for. And I think certainly uh, critics from the liberal arts quite correctly see this as, as, as a rather, I'll go out on a limb and say frivolous move because it's, it's turning education into the accretion of tiny skills without any kind of sense of how do they relate to each other? How, do they, how are they put together into the view of a whole person? And the whole person can be the citizen, which is the liberal education view, or the professional, which is, if you like, the engineering education view. Uh, an, a, an, edu uh, an engineer isn't somebody who knows how to do this, that, and the other engineering technique. It's someone who has grown as a professional and is wearing the, 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 the lab coat, metaphorically speaking, of being a member of their professional. And I think this is one of the roles that we have in education that we have to be very careful we don't lose sight of. And so viewing the, viewing the curriculum as a whole, including the things that don't necessarily directly relate to completion of a degree in a particular subject, but flesh out and, and make the person, a, a, the old German idea of building, they're growing into a fully rounded professional or future citizen, is I think something we have to be really careful we don't lose sight of. And technology can both um, act against that, but I think in other areas it can actually help us, help us do that. So, so I, I, I would challenge us all to, in all of our areas of interest in technology to think both about the uh, immense potential and also the pitfalls. Thank you. That was a wonderful, Professor Potts. And I'll be coming back to you with hopefully a few more thoughts, uh, which I would love to uh, bounce off you. Uh, Dr. Namrata, you're doing some amazing work with the bank and uh, with the World Bank. And uh, would love to hear your thoughts about what should be the strategies for education institutions going forward, particularly higher education in the context of uh, digitalization. So any thoughts on that, on that please? Yeah, thank you. No, thank you again, you know, echoing everybody else on the panel for having me and all of us here together at the conference, putting together a, a fantastic uh, session and conference and I'm uh, honored and delighted to be here this morning with everybody. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's uh, connected. Like Professor Sangra said, I, I work with uh, the World Bank primarily focusing on the South Asia region. And um, unlike, I think, many of uh, the experts connected on the uh, panel today, um, the perspective I think that I'm, I'm bringing is um, from a relatively uh, diverse set of higher education systems with institutions that some of which make uh, the international rankings and many others are uh, small under-resourced colleges looking at uh, still very first generation reforms. And early on in the pandemic, when um, uh, the need for this rapid pivot to online and remote work um, came about, I think the, the focus of the bank in the South Asian countries where we work was very much on using available resources, available low-tech, high-tech methods, for uh, focusing on continuity of academic work. And how do we at this critical time of the academic cycle for students in South Asia, uh, get those transition and graduation decisions uh, out? How do students continue their uh, academic cycles? Um, but, but that very quickly, I think, uh, gave the realization to many institutions that have made absolutely remarkable efforts towards this technology reorientation that 
this transformation is a possibility. There are low tech options in the uh, short to medium term that can be leveraged and utilized for this uh, technology transformation. But in the longer term, needing a more clear cut strategy on how is this digital transformation going to happen and why is it important? And, you know, here just to say that in South Asia, we have um, the largest number of internet users, I think, in the world. And at the same time, the paradox is that we also have the largest population of uh, people connected to mobiles, but not internet users as yet. So the scope for this growth, the potential for this growth and for the digital economy in South Asia is absolutely immense. Um, higher education institutions have often been at the forefront of this digital transformation. It's higher education students who are uh, often learning and innovating, building uh, uh, digital skills, preparing for this and pushing forward this uh, digital economy. So in the past year with colleagues at the bank, what we've been focusing on is that for this digital transformation strategy, what is really needed is an institutional uh, focus. What do institution leaders um, and IT departments really in, in higher education institutions need to do in order to drive uh, digital transformation while anticipating many of these bottlenecks and you know, critical aspects that Professor Pinsey, Professor Damos have, have highlighted in, in as part of the digital transformation. So, so not to reinvent the wheel, what we did was looked at the frameworks and strategies that many universities have put out there, that the European Commission has put out, that uh, the IFC has uh, developed. And we adapted these essentially for South Asia and came up with eight dimensions across which we think institutions ought to be thinking about digital transformation. Now these cover, um, I won't go through all of them in the interest of time, but these cover aspects of the vision and leadership at the institution level. Uh, do they have the human and financial resources in order uh, to uh, transform digitally, technologically? Um, what is the kind of pedagogical transformation required? What is the kind of organizational re reorientation required? And ultimately, what does this mean for uh, the student who is the ultimate user uh, at the institution? What kind of support systems um, um, career guidance, um, outcome orientation is, is needed when focusing on students. And um, I, I think, it, you know, since this exercise was based on reaching out to several universities uh, and colleges in the region, talking to university leaders, and really getting a sense of their needs and requirements, I think uh, a couple of principles that um, um, came out for us that would be important for the transformation process for the strategies um, were as follows. One was um, the role of peer learning. Um, students, faculty, institutions really, I think, uh, observe and learn from each other. And so making a strategy that um, enables that uh, through collaboration, through working with other universities, faculty working with each other, I think would be important. The, the role of behavior change, changing the mindset of faculty and students in order to adopt and adapt uh, uh, to technology and uh, the role of incentives in doing this. And finally, I think the role of support systems. Um, learning is a, a, a social uh, endeavor and um, whether these are ID systems for technology support or peer networks for students to talk to each other, I think those were some, some of the key principles um, that we wanted to highlight in, in putting together uh, a strategy that institutions can use for their uh, technology transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navratan. And if I may come to Dr. Vista now, please. Uh, you're, you're the last but not the least, right? And you know, a very important aspect of education, whether it's science and technology or whether it's the liberal arts and humanities, is work which is done in the field. Could be research, could be uh, experiments in a laboratory. Uh, how does, uh, how do, what is your experience? How do, how could you use technology to ensure that uh, 
learning outcomes on account of the limitations were not compromised as far as experiential learning and fieldwork based learning was concerned or, or laboratory learning was concerned. Great question. Thank you for having me. It's a certainly an honor and privilege to be here uh, with the colleagues. Um, during the pandemics, we certainly leveraged the potential of using technology, a variety of the tools uh, in the classroom and outside, particularly, you know, I am in the Star Scholars Network, the network of at least 17,000 professors from the global south. And also I am the professor at the Morgan State University, one of the HBCU research university. Uh, and being a graduate program as a faculty, uh, we did a lot of you know, um, the research collaboration with our faculty colleagues around the globe. Uh, particularly, I was involved with our research students and scholars uh, preparing manuscript for the book projects, journal articles. Uh, the good news, we were able to produce 10 books in collaboration with Routledge, uh, Taylor and Francis uh, as a part of our book series, as, uh, as well as we also were able to have several journal issues, uh, 15 issues of the journal were published in three different journals. Uh, and also we encourage our scholars from the global south to write manuscript in their own language. So we were able to publish an you know, entire volume in Chinese uh, using all the empirical articles in the Baza Indonesia. Uh, those were some of the research aspect. On the other hand, uh, the faculty colleagues were so much fortunate uh, with the, some support from National Science Foundation grant. Uh, we did the um, experimentic centric, experiment centric pedagogy where we experimented several mobile apps and also we you know, provided the, the devices, the uh, hands-on device, device to the students. They were shipped to their homes in a faculty member using the Zoom and other virtual platform. They were able to conduct several uh, you know, experiments. Um, right now, we have been doing, you know, uh, some of the uh, manuscript preparations based on the, these feedbacks. We also ran some experiment with these students who were on campus during the pandemics, their experience compared with those who were taking classes off campus. Uh, so it was really eye-opening experience uh, and, and uh, opportunity for faculty and admin uh, staff, you know, everyone at the university across the country, across the globe. Um, Particularly, uh, one of the couple of things that inspire, in, uh, you know, and and uh, you know, has given the opportunity to think outside the box, is looking into the resources and our strength. How we have been looking into how we are preparing, uh, you know, skill manpower for the global needs. Uh, our college, university prepared, uh, are preparing particularly youth with a significant technical and sociocultural competencies. Uh, you know, we were you know able to look into, and if you look into. Uh, the in institutions, not only US or many other you know, promising countries, particularly the youth aged between 15 to 24, there is 1.1 billion uh, and the youth and children account nearly 40% of global population. This generation of the everyday, you know, this is a generation everyday living on modern devices and internet. The other 60%, you and I are the dinosaurs, struggling to understand the complexity of technology and then constant need for upscaling and rescaling ourselves. So as a professor, as educators, you know, we are rethinking, rescaling ourselves, how to teach remotely, how to train, new faculty member and adjust the new challenges, considering you know, the limitation of the uh, internet and other uh, technological you know, uh, facilities that we have. So the other aspect, we, we always talk about how you know, privileged we are, but if you look into 87% of the world youth live in less economically advanced countries. And the bigger issues today is include the school dropouts, unemployment, drug, obesity, you know, early pregnancy, teen suicide and mental health. So even in advanced country here in the US, in every 24 hours, at least 1,500 teenagers commit suicide, 2,800 teenage girls become pregnant, 15,000 teenagers use you know, drugs for the first time. If the college and university are prepared to address that needs, how much we are using technology and how we can do it, we can bring a couple of analogy from other field. Uh, recently, Professor Smith in the Atlantic Magazine has mentioned that 16 million American household canceled their cable subscription, cable television were you know, uh, canceled in the last five years. And the music industry lost 50% of its sales from the CDs and MP3s because they were outdated. Um, and the YouTubes and Amazon, you know, Netflix had changed the dimension of entertainment. Um, you know, although initially the folks 
simply dismiss or rejected the power of such digital technologies. And today, it's not too long ago, our professors simply rejected the idea of online education. You know, it was the biggest threat in academia to run online uh, degrees or courses, you know, regarding the quality of these programs, particularly in the workforce. But later in a decade, you can, you know, look into University of Phoenix or Indira Gandhi Open University being some of the largest university uh, in the world. Uh, and whereas some of the traditional universities are in the verge of collapse, you know, or bankruptcy or merging with another institutions. So what I'm suggesting here is, you know, is the power of the technology. And a few years ago, you know, Massive Open Online, the MOOCs, you know, appear, you know, when they appear, making free classes available to everyone with internet access, universities simply dismissed or did not listen the power and, you know, the, 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 its connection, you know, simply to the, those who did not have access. Today, for me, particularly, I like to call every single institutions, you know, our kind of MOOC, you know, MOOCs, working their online teaching, you know, uh, preparing on their curriculum and activities. Um, and then also developing new identities and the brand um, and, and, and also creating new programs, including the blockchains network, computer simulation, uh, the biggest one, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual realities, and robots have been used as a teaching assistant. Those yeah. kind of technology is the one to connect the, our youth and, and address the you know, bigger global needs um, you know, in the US or elsewhere. Um, and some professors have been also talking about subscription-based education and the way a student pay premium to go to college. You know, they can take the best college from best professor anywhere on the planet. Um, and a few colleges, you know, including Georgia Tech in the U.S., has experimented the subscription model and then using robots, you know, simulation, those things. So, you know, and also they are talking about the a transcript of life, more digital trails that creates, you know, lifelong transcript, including military history, intensive apprenticeships, and other relevant you have to, experience. You know, that is those a bit short of this yeah. Yeah, so th those things. So I, I stop here. I know, you know, we, we have to, I have to be mindful about the time, uh, but certainly, you know, uh, enjoy um, listening our colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Very insightful. Uh, and I want to open a couple of questions to all the panelists. Uh, one question is, we've been through this over the last year and a half. We have, some of us have struggled. Some things have worked well. Some things have not worked so well. How do you see the future? What role is technology going to play in helping higher education institutions and universities improve outcomes for various stakeholders? I think that is the critical question we need to think about as we go forward. Anybody? Um, I, I, well, Chris, Krishna, if, if you're a dinosaur, uh, I'm a trilobite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that, that um, one of the one of the it, it's very easy for us to make predictions about the future, and the one prediction I think we can all make is that we'll be wrong. Um, if you go back uh, fifteen years, there was no social networking. It's completely transformed society. Uh, a technology which seemed you know, was to help um, a bunch of college kids stay in touch with each other. Uh, has had profound effects on democracy and elections that were totally unpredicted. And um, I think in the early days, at least unforeseeable. Not much longer ago than that, we didn't have smartphones. And so I think that uh, the kinds of things that, that Krishna was talking about uh, are likely to have very dramatic impacts in the future. We don't know when, we don't know which ones they'll be, we don't know what the impacts will be. Um, but but they are going to be very significant. And I think that one of the challenges we face in higher education is that um, we, we, we portray ourselves as innovators, but we have very entrenched cultural practices that go back in some cases centuries. And, and um, I, I think that this is, the, this is the clash between technological possibility and uh, cultural caution. Is, is going to be the really interesting uh, area. I mean, to be abstract about it, we could choose particular examples. Um, but I, you know, I, I, if you look, for example, at the effect that technology has had on the news industry and on the music industry, they have not been beneficial in my opinion. They've been profound, they've been unstoppable, 
um, we can predict them now in retrospect as obvious. It was obvious it was going to happen. And in 10 years time, 20 years time, panel of people like us can say the same thing about higher education in the 2020s. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I'm not as optimistic about the future uh, uh, because I do think that some of these, some of these changes will have, uh, for example, I think will lead to higher education becoming much more vocational in its topic structure. I'm not sure that that's a healthy thing for society, in, but, but that's one thing I think might happen. So I, I, I put that out as a possibility, but with the very, very big proviso, the asterisk after it, that I don't really know, and I don't think any of us do. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, so, so, so if, I, if I may, uh, go sure. ahead. Yeah. Yes, Ravi, please. No, I, I just wanted to make a few observations. Um, I, um, you know, uh, just to kind of uh, put it in perspective, uh, the three largest providers of content since uh, Krishna talked about MOOCs on Coursera as an example, happen to be Google, Microsoft, and U University of Michigan. So we, we do know a lot about this field. And uh, going back to Colin's comment about how uh, pretty much every prediction is likely going to be wrong, I agree with him. Uh, if you remember when the MOOCs came on, uh, we were talking in terms of, oh, this is the end of higher education and the Absolutely. universities are gonna shut down and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and all of that has been wrong. So I wanna take a little different approach here. Uh, the likes of University of Michigan, the Harvards, the Missouri Science and Technology, all these well-known schools, uh, the residential experience is not going away anytime soon. It is here to stay. Uh, it is not going away. The idea is, however, the lessons that we have learned in the last two years could be leveraged to enhance that residential experience. And I can give you many, many examples. Uh, large classes, for example, we have found out through the pandemic that it's very easy to conduct those lectures online and then take those large classes and break them up for a lot of experiential learning, problem solving sessions in smaller groups. So that part can continue to happen in residential, whereas large lectures could be provided both synchronously and asynchronously. We have found out through the experience that oftentimes in-person classes sometimes privilege people who are extroverts and who are very open to and comfortable talking in large groups and disincentivize people who perhaps may be on the shy side. Uh, online activities allow these learners to also express themselves and kind of become part. So that inclusive nature will continue to play a large role. We also learned that through the pandemic that overall our faculty colleagues in a forced digital transformation, let's face it, no one wished for this, but this is what we, this, these were the cards dealt to us and human ingenuity stepped up and responded in the best way we could, but the technical skills and awareness of technology has significantly gone up. That's gonna play a huge role. Um, at Michigan, we experienced that virtual office hours and virtual advising, advising for curriculum and so on, the uh, participation went up significantly. So those type of activities are here to stay. Uh, Colin initially talked about data. We are sitting on incredible amount of data, including how many meetings we have overall every year. All of that data is there. We are a meeting rich society in higher education. So it is possible now to look at that data and make some significant changes. So again, the point is technology is here to enhance all of us, not replace us. Residential experience is not going away anytime soon, but it is going to enhance access to more people broadly all across the world. Thank you, Ravi. And I think Professor Damur also was uh, wanting to come in and then Namrata, I'll bring you in after that, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I really uh, appreciate this discussion. And uh, one thing that's for sure, the universities are going to change. So, and we typically had this idea that, uh, you know, you were online in university or in present university, you know, on campus. And it was like, you're one or the other. But today we realize that we will be many to be in the middle of that. So very hybrid and uh, experimenting and offering new ways to leverage knowledge, to leverage uh, being together, peer learning, exchange, collaborating, and, and all sorts of experiential learning uh, process. So I think that that's, that's very clear. For, for our point of view, it's very clear. What will be challenging 
will not be the online side. It will be the campus side. It will need to be better. It will be to be more vibrant, to be more attractive, to, to enhance uh, its, uh, its contribution. If students are comparing both and believe that they're equivalent, there is a challenge there. We, that means that we have not find the capacity to leverage, to reinvent ourselves in a way. And uh, one thing that uh, students are telling us and they appreciate, so we've been doing some uh, experiment on reverse uh, pedagogy or learning reverse class. I don't have the exact uh, wording in English, but this idea that, you know, you learn at home and you experiment in class. And so, you know, we, my generation, we would learn in class and do our own work at home. Now, well, we are shifting this around and uh, it's pretty good because sometimes students are mind absent for some moment and they cannot rewind in class but when they're at home they can rewind and they can listen again and do a quiz and you know they have more ability so they are a lot of new stuff coming that will make learning better and more useful last thing i want to say in terms of data and share with you we since we've developed our, our learning management um, system at Laval, we've also implemented some uh, AI capacity. Those were so useful. These tools are telling our students if according to what we learn and how they interact and what they, grades they get, if they are going towards success or not. And it flags them that something might not be going so good and they invite them to go to the, the counseling and get advice. What we could do during pandemic, when the pandemic, when everybody was saying, it doesn't work in the university system, student will not succeed and all that. We were able to get that data, do the analysis collectively, globally, and say, no, things are going very well and students are gonna succeed. It's tough, it was tough for everybody. It was tough for students, it was tough for the teachers, but there are some great capacity out there and we're gonna see those capacity come out in the coming years, but they are purpose-driven. They're not technology-driven. They're purpose-driven towards higher success for students, higher, better tool to make sure that they can learn, learn the right thing, and also develop their skills. And that's where, you know, the technology is not so good yet to help people learn how to work people, to interact with people, to develop with people, to, to, to think about social challenges. So, so there's a, and, and uh, I think it's Colin, I'm sorry. I'm an engineer, <laughs> and I, I think like you, <laughs> so that's good. So a social a guy coming from a, a social computer background with an engineer. But I think that's, that's another thing we know, and students are telling us we don't just want to learn, we want to develop ourselves. Uh, Dr. Namrata, very quickly, please, because uh, we must take a couple of audience questions before we close. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll make this really quick. And I think actually Professor Pins and Professor Damors have, you know, already touched on this, but in the context of South Asia, since you were talking about sort of where do we see, how do we see technology playing out in the future? Um, the point about data systems and gathering more data, and this has been a, a move in South Asia towards uh, stronger accountability systems. And um, you know, really getting institutions to uh, be accountable for the kind of student outcomes they're developing. And the use, basically uh, gathering all of the data now, getting data systems to talk to each other, I think has, with more use of ERP systems in, in South Asian universities, I think this is a, a move that is probably likely to continue, and I would say for the better. The other, uh, I think, big point, again, in the context of South Asia, is going to be that the aspiration for higher education means that there's going to be more and more students coming into the system, which is already very large. 
and leveraging technology to expand this access may be something worth thinking about uh, you know, in, in sort of an, an environment of limited financial, uh, physical and human resources. So, um, so just those two points. Okay, great. So here's a quick, a wonderful question that's come in from the audience. How do we humanize digital platforms for students? Uh, I, I think, um, uh, Sunil, uh, we have to uh, listen to the students. We have to do, take a lot of feedback. Uh, we have to do a lot of user experience testing. And uh, really, we need to think in terms of the uh, comment Professor Diamors made that the technology is there to support the constituency, whether it's student, faculty, or staff, not the other way around. Uh, just because it's cool doesn't mean we have to use it. Uh, is it actually serving your purpose? And provide all the appropriate types of training that's there, not make assumptions. I know somebody's 18 year old, so must already know this. Uh, bad idea. It just depends on uh, what the situation is, what our lived experiences are. So based on all of that, I think uh, we need to, we are able to then humanize some of these platforms, but we have to listen to and observe users. Yeah, I think it was Krishna who, 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 who mentioned the Georgia Tech large scale master's programs. Uh, and I, I was there uh, when those were developed. And uh, I, I will admit, I was a little bit skeptical precisely behind the pre, because of the preconception behind this question that perhaps this would dehumanize the student experience relative to being on campus. And this was long before our, our pandemic experience, of course. And I have to say I was wrong. The, um, uh, the, 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 these are large pro these are large degree programs and there are lots of uh, both university curated and student led um, groups. Um, social groups where the students just basically hang out. They talk about their work, they talk about their, 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 their projects, and they talk about stuff. And the, the, there's some evidence that they're more engaged in, quote, campus, the virtual campus, than the residential students are. So I think we underestimate the power of technology to bring people together sometimes. I mean, I started today by saying, isn't it wonderful that we're being all brought together in this way? And yes, we're just little boxes on a screen and we, we don't get to really shake hands and really interact. But, but the, the, the benefits of, of something like this are huge and we can follow up afterwards, I think, by building connections. So, so in many ways, I think technology already is humanizing interaction in ways that if we look, we will see. Um, and, and, and it's very easy to, and perhaps I was guilty in my earlier remarks of, 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 of fueling this. We're sometimes guilty of, I think, caricaturing technology as, as dehumanizing by necessity. Sure. Well, and, it, you, and it's not. One, right. And one more uh, lovely question from the audience, which is that uh, can, uh, you know, the integration of technology or the leveraging of technology in higher education in universities benefit from uh, a more structured approach? Have we done some things over the last year and a half which have been relatively ad hoc? Yes, uh, for any technology that we leverage, I guess you know, our goal, our mission is to serve the students. But the challenge is how much are we asking students for what they need and what their employers are looking for? Uh, as a professors, you know, you know, we usually do not spend a lot of time with the students in designing, developing, or delivering the curricular, uh, curricular activities. Um, so, so, you know, many of my colleagues and I have even noticed are, you know, we are still teaching the same way we were taught 20 years ago or even longer. Um, in a personal experience, working with the faculty colleagues as a Canvas ambassador, you know, helping faculty colleagues in uh, designing the course modules in our Canvas learning, uh, pl learning platform. Uh, many of them were thinking of retiring, not, you know, designing course, so it was too much work for them. When I started working with them in, in, you know, gradually at the end of the, you know, two months or three months, uh, some of them were kind of okay. And, and some of them were, you know, rethinking about taking quality control trainings and, uh, and exploring the new ideas. Um, and and some, of our, some of us, you know, were giving two long lectures on the Zoom, you know, for 35 minutes to one hour lectures. Uh, no interaction. And this particular conference is also innovative, you know, Neo, instead of, you know, us asking or delivering, a, you know, a lecture for 20 or 30 minutes, how nicely we have been, you know, taking about five minutes or three minutes turn and making it more interaction. So many of us, you know, still would like to explore. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 
Sure, sure. Still, sure. we like to explore these things, but we are not exploring in details and in maximizing the you know applicability of this one, such as the breakout rooms, you know, some discussion board, or you know, peer interaction among the uh, students. So there are lots of things to you know that unfolds uh, as you go in the you know uh, field. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request everyone for quick closing comments? And my request is uh, not more than 30 seconds, please, per person. Yeah. Uh, shall we start in the same order, uh, Professor Damurs? Well, I think that we're going to go through a period of uh, trying and testing and learning. And uh, this, uh, this transition period, if I can call it like that, will be very stimulating. And I think that we need to take our time, particularly uh, post-COVID. We, we did survey all year long, and people are changing their mind every time. Things are evolving. We need to work with our community. Thank you. Ravi? Well, well, thank you again, first of all, for the opportunity to participate in this session. And, you know, this past year has not been easy for anybody. And uh, uh, it's, been, it's been a tough, tough time, but we also learned some interesting lessons. And uh, one of the lessons I'm taking home uh, from my own personal experiences is uh, higher education has so much to contribute and change the world for better and to make a positive difference. So I think conferences such as these and others, when we all of us come together, we will be able to make a difference. And it is our responsibility to step up and get it done. Wonderful, thank you. Colin. Yeah, absolutely. It's our responsibility. And I think that uh, to, to come back to the metaphor of dinosaurs, and maybe ground mammals, um, I actually see, I'm very, very hopeful about the future in terms of the students I see. They, they're not interested in what courses they were, they're going to take. They're interested in the difference in the world they want to make. And it's very gratifying to see this. Um, I think actually as faculty and as educators, our role is to facilitate them and where appropriate to get out of their way. Because in many ways, I think they're more forward thinking and imaginative and innovative than, than perhaps the, uh, our job is not to hold them back. Our, our job is to, is to, to make the most of their potential. Um, and uh, I, I think to the extent that technology can really liberate that, this is what we should be really doing. So. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Namrata, 30 seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the last question, actually, Professor Sandra, that you raised, you know, about uh, should there be a more structured uh, approach to technology transformation going forward? I think for me, that sort of encapsulates, you know, the, the big takeaway over here that um, a, a very uh, deliberate, uh, along with stakeholders, partners, um, private players, um, you know, coming together at the table and institutions chalking out for themselves with their students in mind what those individual journeys should look like. And then, of course, in the context of, of South Asia, um, as one of our uh, colleagues in the bank so eloquently uh, says that the last mile should now be thought of as the first mile in terms of addressing the digital divide and making sure that we uh, have, go along with this technology transformation with equity. Um, so I'll, I'll close there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bista, 30 seconds, please. Sure. Uh, thank you. New technologies, you know, have certainly produced innovative platform um, that includes convenience, personalization, and interactive uh, among the learners and the teachers both. We are entering certainly a golden age of learning. Uh, it's time to reimagine our outdated model of, model of learning and teachings. Uh, even imagine the cost and the resources of this mega submitted OP Zindal if we, if we were doing this in person how lucky we are connecting around the globe via internet. Um, you guys are certainly amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, we could have gone on all day because there is uh, so much to talk, so much to look forward to, and so much to work towards going forward into the future uh, to, for leveraging technology for better outcomes for all of us. But I think in the short time that we had, we've covered some very interesting issues, uh, come out with pointers that will help us as we go forward. And uh, on behalf of the OP General Global University, uh, my our sincere thanks to each one of you for having taken time out, for having prepared for these sessions. And it was wonderful having you over. Uh, we hope sooner rather than later, which can, we can actually meet in person. And we will be delighted to welcome each one of you uh, to our campus 
uh, at Sonipat in the Delhi NCR region in India. Thank you very much and wish everyone uh, all the best and a great journey forward.